Hey guys, welcome back to the Ice Project. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, first of all, this podcast is sponsored by YKTR. High Summer's out now, so jump online, buy yourself something doozy, www.yktr.com.au. One of my oldest friends in the building in the house right now, but for now, roll the intro. Wade Santini Cooper, what's up? What's happening? <laughs> what's, that, what's going on? Why are you in Sydney? Uh, I just got eight days off in, in Japan, so I thought I'd pop back here, be able to catch up with the fam, um, get a few things sorted with my house, things like that. So just popping back, get some sun as well, you know. Is it cold up there at the moment? Getting cold, bro. How's, uh, what's Japan like? Bro, it's a beautiful place and, and the people are amazing. Um, the footy's, uh, it's a little bit lower standard than here, but our rugby program's really good, so it's very stimulating still, but it's a, it's a great place to live, man. Mm. All right, so um, anyone, a little backstory on me and Quaid. I've known Quaid since I was four or five years old. We went to primary school together. He was my best mate. I uh, had another guy in our crew. His name was Sean Maitland as well. And when I think about it right now, for all three of us to come from a small town like that and play professional rugby league or rugby, it's pretty crazy, eh? Bro, 100%. And to, to think that, like, your dad was our coach. Um, Sean's dad was our coach. Things like that. We both went on different paths, but basically ended up in the same spot. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, and someone brought it up the other day. And like, how did you, how did you three make it? And I was like, I don't know. When, when, but when I think about it, like when we were young, we didn't really have that guy to look up to and go, oh, he's yeah. from Tokyo, he can make it too. Yeah. Like maybe had like Walter Little, Kevin Milami, yeah. all those sort of guys like that. But there wasn't that one guy we could go, shit. If he can, if he can come from Tokyo, maybe I can. I and it's crazy to think us three made it, and we were we were best mates and like. Yeah. I don't say that term lightly. Like we were, we were like best yeah, mates. Eh? Everything, bro. Yeah. Um, so l- let's talk about upbringing back in Tokyo. What's it like growing up in Tokyo for people that don't know? Yeah, well, bro, like Tokyo. When you from the outside looking in, it's a tough place to grow up. But for us, it was just fun because your best mates, like you lived on the other side of Tokyo, mm. but it was like a walk to get there. Like you know what I mean? So you jump on your bike, ride over there. We're always hanging out after school at your house. Um, my house, Sean's house, playing out on the field, running around, kicking a football. Stay out as late as you want walking the streets, things like that, um, you can't take for granted now. Well, yeah. It's just a fun place to grow up, bro. Yeah, that's crazy. Like, when you think about that now, like, kids walking home after, not, like, it's kind of a scary thought now, isn't it? Right, like, my, my little brother, um, when, like, when he was at start of high school, mm. I was like, mate, you're not walking to school or going to the bus by yourself. I'll drop you off. And yeah, things like that. Whereas in high school, yeah, like, he, bro, like going. He's your baby in them. <laughs> yeah, but I was, you know. But for me, it was like all the things that I did as a kid, and I see him doing, like, even when he, we, he started touching alcohol, like, he's 17 now and they went to schoolies. In my head, I'm thinking, mate, I don't want you near any of that stuff. You know mm. what I mean? But, like, it is baby. But we, were, but we were drinking at, like, 14, I remember. I, exactly, bro. You know, we won the grand final at a yeah. party at, like, 14. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ah, mate, don't, no, don't need to be doing that. You look at a 14-year-old now and you're like, oh, what are your parents like, doing? Yeah, you know what 100%. I mean? 100%. But, yeah, it's just how we grew up. Uh, yeah, obviously, like, like, Quaid used to always stay over my house. I used to stay over his house, and like my my older brother used to sort of brush us a little bit because he was kind of a bit too cool. So me and Quaid, we sort of grew up, and like we were competitive with each other, weren't we? And you you're a lot probably I was competitive at the time, but you always had that little like like fuck on and get you. Yeah, had to. And there was a time we used to have this fort at our thing. We said this is our this is a small town we grew up in. We used to have races down the pole and see who could get down the pole the quickest. And I remember it was between four of us, and it was just me and Quaid at the end, and we were timing it because someone had a stopwatch, and then we ended up just. Jumping, jumping off, off jumping off bro, and that's how, how and we, just let, we just let gravity do its yeah, work it's like so you could jump off the fastest you know what I mean so instead of just sliding down it started, started at that and then it was like someone dropped from halfway and it was like fuck I'm just gonna jump off yeah and the next one jumped off and time was like fuck that's what we were all about everything we did was just competing always competing and Sean like Sean was probably more talented than both of us put together in terms of being an, yeah. being, <laughs> being an athlete but he wasn't as competitive as us was right. he and that's why I still remember the story and I always tell it whenever I'm, I'm with Shawnee um, we had like the five year old um, cross country mm. and it was just once around those two fields down down on the bottom field and I told him that the finish line was um, so he sort of run all the way around instead of getting back to the side I told him it was at the other mm. other corner so he's winning, I'm coming second, and he gets to that corner and stops, and I run past him. Oh. He starts running again, we get to the end, I win it, and his mum blew up. She lost it. She's going to kill me. <laughs> She's chasing me around. She's like blind. Sean would have been crying too. Sean like. was crying. <laughs> He's like, oh. Sounds like him. She's going... Um, she's going, my auntie's going, Shawnee, why'd you stop? Like, oh, Quaidy told me that was the finish. <laughs> and I'm pissing myself, laughing. I'm five years old. 
So you've been a dog since you were five, huh? <laughs> you got to win anything to win. Yeah, I remember five. This was a bit older. Like we we played league together, probably from like six all the way up to about yeah, fifteen. Yeah. Um, people don't really understand your story. They think you've turned your back on New Zealand and stuff like that. Mm. But we played league all the way up to there. And I remember one time, um, like we were okay. When we were on the same side because we we're both competitive and we both could play footy with each other. But as soon as one got on the other side, and there was one time we were playing touch and like started getting a bit like it's touch on the beach with our mates. And I ran ran the ball and this, oh, this bloke fucking grass cut me in the game of touch. And I got up, I was a foot, I was about to cry about the punch. He goes, "Yeah, fuck, let's go then." So that's how we that's how we grew up. Yeah, exactly, bro. Little little kids from Tag just streaming big. All right, so um, so tell us your story. Like, why did you go to Australia, or what was the reason behind that? Um, oh, bro, like, as you know, like we were like we were making rep teams, things like that. But like, I had my mates, like so, Ice was my mate, you, Shawnee, and that. But then I also had my other mates that were like starting to get into trouble, all that sort of stuff. You know, a little bit of, um, you know, just things that that you shouldn't be doing as a kid. And were, you, were you a gangster as a kid? <laughs> <laughs> One of you gangster. <laughs> yeah, we we thought we were gangsters, you know. But yeah. like that's that's what. We sort of grew up wanting to be, you know what I mean? Like you watch, turn the TV on, you see all the the gangs and bikies um, in tow, you know, the Black Power, Mongrel Mob, things like that. And that, that's what you sort of had to look up to. And um, so we kind of wanted to be like that. And, and it was sort of like a tough image. Um, but also, because uh, um, because you're April, I was December. Shawnee yeah. was September. So we we were like just a year behind you. Yeah, and I like, was because we're in the same classes all the way growing yeah. up. And then out of nowhere, you're like, oh, I'm off to intermediate. Yeah, I I like, oh shit, put up a grade. Yeah, yeah. And so I was hanging out with all older people. Mm. And then so the same thing, bro. Like when when I, I look back at that, I'm like, I was just hanging around with so much older kids. And then so I was getting up to to mischief and things like that. And then my mum was like, um, sent me over to Australia mm. to live with my auntie. Uh, when I went over there, I got a bit homesick. Same sort of thing, got homesick, used to being around all my family, got um, two younger brothers, two younger sisters and an older sister, and then all the boys, you know, like mm. hanging out with you, just being able to walk over to your house, things like that. Couldn't do that anymore in Australia. Mm. Um, and so I just got homesick, moved over, and then- So my, when did you go? You were about 12, 13, yeah? Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, 13. Yeah. And then after that, like I, when, when I got back home to, to New Zealand, I, I loved it again, just being back around all the boys, things like that, started playing like- footy again stuff like that and I had all these scholarships over in Brisbane that I basically just turned my back on because yeah. I just wanted to be home in, in tote so my mum just packed the whole family up and took us over to Australia and then from there I got a scholarship at, at Churchy and, and basically signed my contract with the Reds a year later It's quite a big school Churchy eh? Massive bro it was a massive culture shock for me and mm. Oh, we were talking about it yesterday, the, the Batuta Advocate boys. Yeah. That's where they're from as well, you know. Yeah, so like it's a, I messaged him. I was like, oh, you, oh, do you go to school with Quaid now? Yeah, yeah, we know, we know the hooks. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm looking forward to having them boys in next week. Yeah, Should be a bit luck. of a giggle. But, yeah, yeah so, what was Shirty like? Bro, like – Compared to Forest View High School. It gets money, man. You Everyone's know got I mean? money? Yeah, money. Like So, you get there and, like – So, what we're brought up around, like someone that's rich in tow – Got like, five bucks. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, you get there buying lunch every day instead of packing it. Whereas <laughs> – in um at churchy like just turn up in in mercs like the young kids like great um just get their license driving driving to school in a porsche or a merc or something like mm. that. so it's just a different culture man but it, like i had fun and i think that the the thing that i had in common was just footy, footy. yeah you know, when you play footy it doesn't matter sort of how much you earn whatever whatever your background you you also come together and you're just a footy team. Mm. You, know, so. you would have been one of the better players that you obviously you and Pocock was there as well. Yeah, eh? Pocock was there as well. You guys, um, did you guys win all your high school comps and stuff? Or yeah, we, the first year I was there, we won won the tournament. And again, bro, like if if you're at one of these schools and and your rugby team's going well, you can sort of do anything. Mm. And then once I signed my contract, I pretty much checked out of school. I was thinking that's all I've wanted to do ever since I was young. It, all the hours we put in as kids and that. It was all starting to come to fruition. So I was just like wanting to check out of school. I just wanted out of there. Mm. So, yeah, obviously moved into the Reds quite young, quite a good system. Um, tell us about the journey from there. Yeah, bro, that, like, that was a, a lot of fun. But, it was again, it was just growing up fast. Mm. It was going from high school to hanging out with adults. And like, I wasn't even old enough to, to go out clubbing and that. Mm. And, you know, sometimes I was, I was going out, sort of sneaking out, getting in with, with the lads, um, things like that. And you just sort of – by being around older people – you kind of lose that little bit of your childhood. Mm. And, uh, you know, I was sort of speaking about my little brother going to, to schoolies. I wasn't even allowed to go. Like, I, I snuck down there for, for a night, but I was supposed to be at preseason. Mm. Um, and all I wanted to be was an 18-year-old kid. And you sort of – you don't really understand responsibility, things like that. And it, it wasn't until 
you know, a few years later in my career that I started to understand that, you know, I started to also like kind of embrace it as well. Yeah. So Reds were sort of a team that call them a bit of a stepping stone, you know what I mean? People used to rock up and go, oh, this is an easy game. Yeah. Um, it was like that for a while. Well, it was a couple of years, wasn't it? Right. Like the, the first, what, four years, it was like last, last, second, last, last. Mm. You know, and I was, I was sort of over that. And like, you know, something that we spoke about was like throughout our, our childhood, we are just so used to winning. Mm. Um, then I went to church, you winning again. Like we won the comp. Um, you know, so I was just so over losing. And I remember asking for a release. Like, I was like, man, I want out of here. And then that's when you and Mackenzie sort of took over and, and things changed pretty quickly because, you know, the thing that when he came on, he, he just spoke to me about how we're going to play, what we're going to do different, um, why we're going to be successful. And, like, it just all started to click from there. Mm. What year did he come, 11? Uh, 2010. 2010. In 2010, we went from last to, um, I think we came fifth. Yeah. But, like, the way that we were playing, like, mate, we were packing out the stadium in 2010 just because people were turning up for – for a show and a brand of football that yeah. they weren't used to seeing in rugby yeah, union, exactly. wasn't it? Yeah, like it was just something that was was fun, enjoyable. The ball was just going from end to end. Like we might lose a game, but the, the game would be like 45 40, you yeah. know what I mean? So, like, just points being scored. So, for everyone in Queensland, it was just something they hadn't seen. And mm. then the next year, we sort of went a step further and we, we obviously won it, but all the games that were tight, we'd win. It would be 45 yeah. 40 to us, mm. you know? So, <laughs> mate, like. That's where things changed for me, and I just started to have fun again. So when I when I think back on sports people, as I sort of relate them to a year, so I think Benji 05, I think Sonny yeah. Bill 04, I think Jared Hain 09, Quay Cooper 2011, yeah. pretty crazy year in terms of fucking highlights package, in terms of winning the comp. What did it feel like that year? Did you know you were coming into a good year? Or yeah, bro, like it's again, it was off the back of that 2010. Yeah, just things just started to work out. You know, and you start to see things go. Oh, the now. Crusaders didn't look like the Crusaders anymore. Yeah, like sort of look, yeah. Well. We beat the Crusaders 2010, and, mm. and I scored 35 points in that game, which was a is a record for Queensland in a game. And like so, for me, it was against the Crusaders, against Dan Carter, like my idol, mm. um, all these sort of guys. And now I started to realize and, and see myself as being as good as them. Mm. You know, I mean, instead of just seeing them as your idol, I was seeing myself as oh, I can compete with these guys. We can beat these guys. Mm. And then so the next year, when everything started to click. Right, everyone had that mentality, and we just had fun, man. Like off the field, if you said, "Okay, we're going to go to a a, a bar or something," like, the whole team was there. Mm. So if you said, "Oh, bro, boys, I'm going to dinner here," the whole team was there, bro. Like it was just that sort of culture. Uh, the boys said, "You know, I got a birthday. It's my missus' birthday." In the whole team there, you know what I mean? Like, so that sort of thing. We, it's, it's kind of a good, good place for Brizzy like that because I know the Bronx yeah. developed a culture around that sort of yep. sort of lifestyle well and you guys are pretty similar. Yeah. You, and get, you get looked after up there too, don't you? Oh, bro, we got looked after like, really well, especially when we were winning, mm. you know what I mean? But it's, it's like anything. When, you, when you're losing, everything's like – Magnified, looked, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? So like when we were winning, like things that we did and we, we got away with, um, but it's sort of – put sort of bad habits in you mm. or when, when you do start losing or something like that because eventually you might have a bad game, things like that, and come down hard on you. Mm. So, yeah, obviously when in the um, you guys won the comm that year, rolled into the World Cup, yeah. shit comes crashing down pretty quick, doesn't yeah, it? Right. Well, th- I think that like, – You got yeah. a bit of trouble too on Twitter and stuff. You were quite vocal in them days, weren't you? Yeah, like the, bro, because the thing was, man, is that like – we started winning and stuff and we just thought we were just going to win everything. Mm. Um, and it was not, not that it was going to be easy, but just – even saying things, I, I started to have a voice and started to realise that, like, when you got a little bit of power, um, I was like, man, I'm just not, not going to get pushed around anymore, you know? I'm going to say what I want to say. If I'm feeling a certain way, I'm going to say it. Mm. Um, and when I started to do that, that's when a little bit of backlash as well because there's people who, you know, obviously people who are your fans, people who hate you. Mm. But when you start speaking out or sort of saying things that you think, that's sort of magnified again. And then if you lose... And then obviously that Richie McCaw stuff, mm. that just turned the whole nation against me. Like, <laughs> mate, already, I, did you I, did you um, name on the head on purpose? Yeah, yeah, hundred eight. Like, yeah. And and the thing is, bro, like it was one of like the stuff that happens on a footy field, like, mate. That's so small. Like, mm. I've been punched in the head, kneed in the head, all that sort of stuff. But it was who you did it to. Mm. Um, and already I was a Kiwi boy playing for Australia. With a multi tattoo on your arm, yeah, exactly. you know what I mean? So they're already already hating on me to to start with. So then I go and need the captain of the All Blacks, untouchable in in the head. Mm. Uh, no, that's just even even worse, mate. I might as well, you know what I mean. So I walked into New Zealand for for the World Cup, and it was just like I'd never been involved in anything. Like I couldn't walk, couldn't go anywhere. But 
people coming up asking for photos and stuff like this. Yeah. As soon as they're away, like I was on a team bus, bro, and everyone's just shouting at their signs, I hope you break your leg, hope you die in this game, mm. things like that. I've just never been a part of. Like it was just like I kind of went from being like well known to just like well known uh, and hated. Yeah, the most well known and the most hated. Or mm. do you know what I mean? And it was just like it was crazy. And I, and I look back at it now, and I'm like, I wasn't ready for it. You mm. know, like I, I had the expectation of 2011 of playing good football, but now I had the pressure of all these guys hate me as well. You yeah. know, and a whole country, not just like rugby public, because because. Re- all Blacks are religion in New Zealand. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, if they win, like, everyone's happy. If they lose, everyone's down. And, yeah, you're sort of needing captain in the head. <laughs> exactly, bro. And, and, then, and then I'm standing in front of the public basically denying it all. Going yeah. Like, going like, nah, but I, Do you reckon like, you, wish, you, you wish you'd come out and go, yeah, I don't know, like, that's bro, just something yeah. that happens on the footy field? Yeah, if I, if I had my time again, like, because I know how to handle it now, you know what I mean? Like, I just say, yeah, I did it, like, mm. like fuck, so mm. what? You know what I mean? Not that it's so what, but, like, as part of footy and it was a bad play – but I did it, you know. Mm. And then what can people say? Because people just kept hammering me because I never said that I did it. Because mm. it was something that like, well, just just tell us, did you do it? And I'd be like, no, I didn't. Mm. So then the question just kept going, kept going, kept going. And then a few years later, I, know, I seen Richie in the airport and I just went up to him and said, mate, like, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, he wouldn't have given a fuck, would nah, he? No, like, yeah, see, well, it's not that he, he, he didn't care or he, or he did care, but when I said sorry to him, like, I just – Confronted it, yeah, and said, "Look, man, I really looked up to you as a, as a kid. Like you were my idol. Mm. Like everyone in New Zealand loves you, and I, I loved you. So when I played against you, it was just like emotion, um, passion, all that sort of thing took over. You were playing dirty on me. I played, and I, and I need you. Because I heard he's got a bit of grub in him, eh? Oh, mate, one of the one of the one best. Of this, yeah, you know what I mean. Do you know who's another one that's like like that in football? Like a few of the Melbourne boys are like um, yeah. they got all a bit of grub in them, yeah, but they yeah. they come off all polished and shit. But they're yeah. not. Once you play them, you're like, oh shit. See, and that's bro. That's that's like in rugby the same sort of thing. Like like Dave Pocock. Yeah, mate. It's not that he's a dirty player. He just goes a hundred miles, and like he'd be in there trying to get the ball, and he might. Grab your head or something like that. Mm. But it's not that he's going in there to grab your head, but the amount of people that are dirty to him. Mm. I mean, he'd be on the ball, people be eye gouging him, stuff like that. And it just happens in rugby, you know what I mean? Mm. So you debuted for the Wallabies quite young, eh? Who did you debut? Did you debut against Italy? Was yeah, that Italy? And you come off the bench, come off your yeah, yeah mad try. Yeah. yeah like, um, but what was it like going? Up, obviously, kid from New Zealand going up against All Blacks. Was that a surreal feeling facing the All Blacks? Obviously, yeah. knowing the anthem and shit. Like, do you know what I mean? Well, that it was confusing, bro. So like, I get out there and like. That's a team that I looked up to my whole life. and Smacking wheat bricks, eh? Putting yeah, cards out the side, you know what I mean? Wanted, like, <laughs> imitating yourself in the backyard, calling yourself Christian Cullen, things like that. Mm. But playing against them, you're standing out in the field and I'm, and I'm like, just a year ago I was supporting you. Now I've, now I've got to hate you. Mm. And because Australia's got to hate the All Blacks and that's what's sort of growing into you, like our training, um, you know, pre-game, like showing you all this stuff that you should hate them, stuff like that. So you stand out in the field going like, looking at the hucker and, and, and you love that stuff, bro. That's mm. what you've grown up doing, you know. Um, so it's a little bit confusing, um, but that's where the motion just comes into it. You just want to do everything you can. It's like playing your best mate. And like we are saying, when we play against each other, I want to take your head off. Mm. Like when I played against Sean, um, when he went, he left Toke, went to Hamilton Boys High, we played against each other and I was just, all I want to do is smack him mm. the whole game. So you play against the All Blacks, same sort of thing. Bro. Mm. And so I feel like, um, yeah, you know, whenever we played against him, it was just that sort of emotion. Yeah, crazy. So, obviously, World Cup, um, you guys had to play that sort of third, fourth game, come off left to right, boom, ACL. Yeah, went to do a step off my right. right. You, you're killing that, that game too, eh? Yeah. Sort of, sort of, you can tell the pressure was off yeah, you, you know what I mean? Bro. And you just, you're playing good football. And I remember, and I, I'd done my ACL, ACL just a year before, so I sort of know how you felt, but I remember looking at it and like seeing your knee going, yeah. You can see it. You can see it pop, eh? So you've gone from feeling almost untouchable to the most hated man in New Zealand yeah. to doing your ACL. In terms of emotional roller coaster, how'd you handle that? Oh, bro, I didn't. And that was the thing, bro. Like, and I had no help, you know? Like, cause, uh, at the time when I look back at it, I was basically, if you look at all the interviews and stuff like that, bro, I had no protection from the ARU, um, you know, from the, uh, from the coaches, things like that. No one came out and really protected me, mm. except for my nana. Yeah. <laughs> like if, you're, if your nana's protecting you Then you're in a strike Yeah, yeah, yeah You know yeah. what I mean? So But um, When I did my knee I was just like I was a little bit lost Because I was I thought oh, I'll come back from this easy you mm. know? But it's It's the, the mental 
aspect of it where it's tough, you know, like, and you've been through it. It's, it's a grind, man. And to come back to that same level, that, that's where I was just like, fuck, can I get back here? And I did everything I could to get back there, but my first sort of season. Did it scare because you're like light on your feet and you're yeah, a stepper? Yeah, but like if you watch the first game that I come back and I come back early because the Reds, we needed to win like, like we 2012 season, we lost the first sort of like six games. Mm. And to get back into the finals, it got to a point where I come back about three or four games early and we needed to win like six games in a row um, to get into the finals. Mm. So I come back and the first game I come back, like I couldn't even step off it. Like mm. I didn't do any contact until the captain's run. And then we grabbed the youngest bloke in the team. Our coach grabbed him, young bloke, Nick Frisby. Mm. And um, he just had to tackle me four times, two on left shoulder, two on his right. And I run at him and the coach says to him, mate, if you injure him, don't even bother turning up to the game tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so this young kid just shit himself. So I run at him and basically he – Touch me with two hands, I'll just fall on the ground. Yeah. And I was thinking, fuck, if I get tackled tomorrow, I'm fucked. Yeah. You know? And then so I went into that game, first play of the game, they put up a high ball because I used to defend that fullback. Mm. I run forward to catch it and one of our guys, James Hall, I was coming backwards to catch it. And like you, the guy coming forward always has rights to catch it. Mm. He sort of got in my way. I jumped up, got knocked from him, landed on the ground and I just, first thing I did was just grab my leg and check and I was like, fucking hell. Yeah, yeah. And then I made a break straight after that and I had the fullback to beat. And if I could step off my right foot, I would have beaten him and scored. Yeah. And I ran and then I kind of went, lined him up and I was like, fuck. And then I ended up just doing like a hit and spin. Yeah. Because I was too, and I just backed into him. And I just knew then something, it's not right. Mm. But I just kept playing and we kept winning. So it kind of like, um, didn't back up what I was feeling because we were winning, but I was just put a band aid over yeah, it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So coming back from that, I just like looking back at all the tapes, but I was, Way off. Like mm. I was limping around on one leg. My leg looked like a toothpick. Um, there's no muscle on it, so there's no control on it. And I had no confidence. Like I didn't step off it for like two years. Mm. Um, but now like I'm fine. Like I've got no issues with it. But going back then, fuck, I shouldn't have been playing. Yeah, 100%. I think about that too. I remember Ivan rushed me back to a game. Like I was only five and a half months done. And he, and James <laughs> Maloney pulled out because he was sick for, for a trial game. Yeah. And like I was like, oh, I just want to get back in because we'd come off the back of winning five games in a row. And yeah. it sort of looked like I was the guy that was getting us there and come back. And then when I look at the game, same Jeez. as you, it like, took me a while to took me a while to get over it. Like you say you're ready, but like we talked about it yesterday. Like yeah. You can lie to everyone, but you can't lie to the person yeah, in the but, mirror. And that was the thing, man. I was – I was trying my hardest to lie to myself. Mm. And it's the same thing with that, like when we just spoke about Richie thing. I was just trying to block it out. Like people say, oh, I had it. Like you're able to block out the booze, things like that. And you go, yeah, and like can't even hear it. <laughs> Most you can hear it. <laughs> Quay yeah. Cooper, you fuck with. Yeah, yeah, you know you don't I mean? just block shit out like that. Yeah, hey, yeah. And when you're on the field, that stuff's so clear. People don't realise. If someone yells out something from the crowd, they might be in row 108 mm. and you hear it dead clear. Quaid, you're a fuckwit. I hope mm. you die, mate. And you're like, oh, fuck. Relax. Yeah, yeah. Man. It's game of rugby. <laughs> so people get confused. Like, they go, you think, they think that you've turned your back on New Zealand, but they don't understand, like, the ARU rules. So you, to play for New Zealand, you have to play for a New Zealand club, right? Yeah. Well, basically, you've got to live there, play for a club. Um, I went through the, sort of like, I spoke to the Hurricanes and Waikato in 2009, I think it was. Mm. Um, or no, sorry, 2008, just before I um, debuted for the Wallabies. Mm. But it's one of those things. My family and that all moves over to Australia as well. So if I moved to New Zealand, I was moving away from my family. Like I already missed seeing my little brothers growing up and stuff like that. So I was sort of at that point where the decision wasn't just about me. So I was like, I end up deciding to stay in, stay in Australia. And from there, like once you play for a country, that's your one country you can play for. Mm. Uh, once you're capped, that's it. Um, so you know what I mean so it's not that I turned my back on on New Zealand or anything but it's, it's more that I lived here my family lived here as well like it was a better life for my family and that like my dad worked at the mill got made redundant had no job so we basically had to move to Australia mm. um, you know where I got my opportunity in, in terms of like professional and stuff was Australia mm. so I kind of just wanted to continue playing there because I, I loved living in Brisbane like it was a good place to live grow up my family was settled so I don't want to move back to New Zealand. And you start thinking about your little siblings like that, like, and you think how we've sort of grown up as well. Yeah. Like, we, we didn't like grow up too rough, but there yeah. was there was enough roughness around us for us to understand it. You know what I mean? And That's it, get your bro. brothers out of there as well. Yeah, and see, and, and for me, like, I, I just think about my little brothers, and I was like, how they were growing up and the life that they had in Brisbane. I was like, man, if I want them to have that life, you know. Mm. 
And so that that's where the sort of decision became to just stay in Australia. Mm. So you started getting into a um, little bit of a disagreements with AIU and stuff like that. Like what, what went on behind the scenes in terms of meetings and stuff like that? Oh, which instant? <laughs> Do you remember that time you telling me about Codanessa and they offered you a contract and they had on it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that. So that was, that was more around um, – so when I had those disagreements with, with Robbie, it was like, so during that time, I came back from my knee injury, things like that. Um, and it basically started off as we, we played Argentina and there was a lot going on in the team, bro. There's a lot of, um, like, um, disagreement in the team. Mm. The, the team was pretty much divided 50 50 between all the young guys and then all the old guys. So the locker room was, um, you know, pretty what, up and Why down. was that? Just the old era and the new era. Oh, so okay. you think about like myself, Kurtley, O'Connor, um, Guinea. Pocock, Guinea. Like us all starters, all like 21, 22. Um, and then you had the older guys. So it was like a clash of – so a lot of these guys were either on the bench or not playing or they were still playing and they wanted the say, but it was like the majority of the guys were our age. Mm. And we'd sort of, again, like come through winning the comp, things like that. So we – it was just a, a battle of power, really, and just the, the locker room was just unsettled. Mm. And then, so, like, there was always disagreements, bro. It was just, like, it was a nightmare and, and the environment, and that's when I said that the environment was toxic mm. because I didn't like how it was making me feel because everyone's just arguing. And after the game, I, I hurt my knee in one of the training sessions and I, and I told the management beforehand and I had a bit of floating cartilage. And I said, fuck, like, I, I don't know if I can play. And they said, no, nah, you'll be sweet. We'll get surgery and stuff, like, Next week when we've got a, a week off, this is the last game we need to win it. And so like, I went into the game and I, and I, I couldn't really kick because every time I kick, that um, bit of cartilage gets stuck in my joint. Mm. And we, um, off the kickoff, threw the ball to me and I, I was hesitated to kick it and I ended up getting charged down and they scored. But at the end of the game, we won the game. And in the media announcement, like Robbie sort of said um, to the media, like, if... If we had a reserve to bring on, because all our boys got injured, mm. then I would have hooked Quaid. I would have, and basically said that to the media and said, like, we won the game, you know what I mean? Mm. And I just played through an injury that you knew about. So I felt really let down and, like, um, sort of embarrassed, like him saying that to, to all the media. Yeah. And then I kind of just took that, and then I ended up saying, like, well, basically, fuck you, you know? Yeah. Like, you've just thrown me out to dry, and I just basically said, well... You're a shit coach sort of thing. Mm. Like not in those words, but I basically said that. Mm. Um, and so we ended up getting in like a bit of an argument and that's when I got fined uh, from the AE. I got fined like 70 grand or something. 70 grand? Yeah. <laughs> and um, Steep fine. Yeah, bro. So I go through all these like hearings and, and stuff like that and then I, like there was other fines that I got, I got fined for um, like just tweeting. Because like, mm. someone asked me like, why I always play FIFA and not the rugby game. And, and like, I just, I t- quote tweeted and said, like, it basically, I just put a emoji and said, like, it was shit. Mm. Like, the rugby game, like, just childish things like that. But it was kind of just taken put, out of context. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I got fined 10 grand for that. Um, so there was just things that were happening. Um, because I, I was frustrated with being injured. I was frustrated at, um, sort of the, the coach not having my back. And then I, so I just felt abandoned a bit, you mm-hmm. know. So we'd gotten like a little bit of a war of words. I ended up getting that big fine, and then we sort it all out, paid the fine, and then I went into a. I just before I paid the fine and stuff, went into sort of doing negotiation, and and they offered me like a zero. Mm. And like, so, can you explain how? Because I've probably got a lot more league fans on here. How does how does Australian Rugby Union do contracts? So you, you do your contract through, um, say. I'll sign with the Queens and Reds or... So they pay you one contract? Yeah, they pay you one contract. So you sort that one and then you sign a top-up. Yeah. So if you're on an ARU contract, um, so let's say you're on um, 200 grand. 100 grand might come from the Reds and another 100 grand come from ARU. Mm. So if you don't get a top-up, you're basically capped at what you can earn. You know what I mean? So that's why a lot of people go overseas unless you're on a top-up. And How many top-ups did ARU hand out? Oh, it just varies, bro. So you might have like sort of 10 or so that are on like really good top ups, and mm. other guys might be on like 50 grand top ups, 100 grand, something like that. Um, but yes, yeah, so I went into this meeting, they called me in for this meeting to discuss my thing, and basically 
he just did it to try and embarrass me, you know, like a big boardroom, everyone in there, and slid me the piece of paper, here's your top up, mate, and it just had a big zero on it. And I was like, <laughs> and I just sort of like. You're trying to flick the page and go, yeah, I was like, where's the rest? Where's the I'm fucking like, rest of it? Is this, is this legit? You know? Yeah. And then Cody just said, yeah, thanks, mate. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Took that contract. We walked out of there. And like, I was like, fuck, so what's happening now? And then a few days later, um, I ended up speaking to the president and stuff like that. And the bloke who, who did that got sacked. Um, <laughs> And then, so then we got, shit. yeah, you know, so, and like it was happening a fair bit, you mm. know, so it's just a bit of uh, a power struggle there. And so then I got, got my contract, like renegotiating stuff, ended up signing it. And yeah, but that, that was sort of the start of, you know, bits and pieces of, um, you know, what was going on there. Uh, so just rolling off the back of that, you said a name in there that's got a bit of an enigma around him, Kota Nasa. Yeah. How'd you get in touch with him? What, what's this? What's his story? Not too many people know much about him, eh? Yeah, and he's, he's he gets a bad rap, but you know, for for me and Sonny, he's, he's been the best thing that's ever happened to us. And Sonny had a fight in in Brisbane, twenty ten, I think it was, or two thousand nine, sorry. Mm. And um, you know, I just bumped into them, got to, I was just going there to watch, and you know, someone came, got me, and said he wants to meet me and stuff like that. So I went behind, said hello to Sonny, met him. Um, and started talking to Coda, and he's just been reading in the media what, what has sort of been happening to me, all that sort of stuff. And he's just seen a kid getting sort of pushed around by a big organisation um, and just wanted to help. And from then on, like, and we were speaking about it yesterday, like I had no idea about money. And you know how managers are, I was just getting done. Like I was paying manager, I had like, I was in debt, had no money, you know mm. what I mean? And like, um, since when I met him, that's when things started to change around. I started to understand these things, got a bit of discipline in, in terms of... What does he teach you? Just about money, bro. Like, What does um, he teach you about money? Um, well, the first one was that, like, you know, I thought that I, I owned a house. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, I was just in debt. <laughs> that's, that's all it was. And if I, so if I didn't get my new contract, I'm just stuck with this mortgage that I would have not been able to pay off, had no money to pay it off, so I've just been in debt, give it back, have nothing. Mm. And then I would have just been... Back to square one, you know what I mean? So I might as well stayed in Toke and worked in the bush. Mm. Um, but he just taught me about it. So basically sold that house. Um, on a, we kept that house and said we're just going to pay it off as fast as possible. So the next two years was just all about every cent that I earned, which is going straight into that house, paid it off, and now I was like free. Mm. So from there it was like, okay, if you want to buy a new house, you've got to have the money to buy that new house. You can't just go and buy it and get a loan. Mm. I was like, okay, so because that's not what we're taught, are we? Yeah, bro. So what, what we're taught is to basically get um, minimum deposit, go yeah, to the bank, yeah, and basically just spend the rest interest. of your life for the rest. Yeah, exactly. And then what happens is, as as a rugby player, like you think about our life, it's so backwards, bro. Like um, everyone finishes school, go to university of five six years, earning nothing, finish uni at like say twenty five. So I'm like, start a job at the bottom, start earning a little bit. By the time they're like 30, mid 30s, pay off the college it. debt. Yeah. Exactly. Pay off your college debt. Now you start earning a good wicket. Mm. Now you start to have your life. Whereas our one, you're 17, 18, you get a lot of money, you earn more money, then you get to about 30, 35, you retire, and now your income sort of stops or mm. it slows right down. Mm. So, in terms of buying a house, if you do it the way that the conventional people do it, and you buy a house, just pay interest off, or buy a couple of houses, and you just pay an interest, and you get to the end of your contract, and then you don't have any money to continue to pay those loans. Okay, now I've got to sell one of them, mm. but you've got to sell it at at the rate of what what the market is at the it, moment. Yeah, yeah. You know, and if the market's in a bad spot, well, you lose money. So now you lost money on that. I'll grab the money that I have left on that. I'll pay this house off. But what about my other one? You know what I mean? So you just end up back at square one. You might not even own that one house outright. So what does he teach you? You get one house, pay it off, pay the next one off? Yeah, upgrade if you want to. Yeah. So like my first house was a three-bedroom, two-bathroom. It was like 650 grand. Mm. Um, paid that off and upgrade to a new house. It was like I think it was like 1.7 mil. Mm. Like bought that. Slight, slight upgrade, 1.1 million upgrade, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like bought that, lived in that. I was, speaking, I was thinking about another bedroom or something. <laughs> Well, yeah, like, and then just kept upgrading, you know what I mean? And then, like, when I got to a house that, like, I was like, oh, I don't really need any, any bigger than this. I just stayed in it, and mm. you know what I mean? Like, so, um, and actually sitting there now in Brizzy, uh, I'll probably put my family in it. But, like, while well, I'm playing over in Japan, but, like, he just taught me about like, understanding money and, and our life's a little bit backwards. Mm. And at the end of the day, 
you know, all these people who are willing to help you, like there's a lot of people who put their hand out saying, oh, I'm willing to help you. But like talk is a bit cheap, you know? Fucking earth. So yeah. there's everyone wants to help you, but no one actually wants to help you. You know, so you they want to help person, themselves, don't exactly. They? Yeah. So the only person that can really help you is you help yourself. And when I learned that, started to look after my money a bit better. And I, and I was saying to you, the code has never taken a cent from you either, right? No, nah, never. Mm. You know, and like, and that's what everyone thinks. You know, everyone just thinks that he he's money hungry. That mm. everything he does is about him making money. He doesn't take a cent from myself, Sonny. Um, he gives. He basically gives us money. Like, so if I make my money, he helps me look after, and he'll say to you, like, you only need this much spending. Mm. This is all I'm going to give you for spending, and help you out here. If you need me to do anything, you know what I mean? So, like, it's just taught me um, responsibility of money. And I was saying to you yesterday, I didn't save a cent. And when I was sitting in that Australian 20s um, camp talking to my mate and he bought a house, which now I understand he didn't really buy a house, but for him to be able to save that money off a $15,000 a year contract, mm. and I'd save the cent. I was just living paycheck to paycheck. Mm. So, obviously, the next guy that comes into this equation, one of the biggest sports stars in the world and one of your best mates, Sonny Bill Williams, how do you, you obviously get to meet him and what's your relationship like with him? Well, he's just like a bigger brother, um, like an older brother that I sort of never had. And He looks like someone that fucking cares, eh? Yeah, <laughs> like 100%. Like he, he's always there. Like the first guy when the stuff sort of broke down at the Reds to send me a message and not just send me a message and say, bro, I hope you're all right. It was, bro, I hope you're all right. Get on a plane, come here, let's train, mm. you know? Um, where actually, like, so he actually put stuff in place to help me out. You know, when you're feeling sort of isolated and alone, he's the first guy to always go there and help, and not just by words, you know, by by sort of by actions. And for me, that we've gone through a similar walk of life and similar um, sort of sporting career, where he sort of burst on the scene, got in a bit of trouble early, so he sort of went through that before me. Yeah. So he was able to give me advice on things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I think that without a guy like him sort of leading me in the, the right direction, I probably would have just gone right off track. When things got a bit tough, I probably would have just chosen a few different options. Because you know what? Like a lot of people can go to you, quote, and go like, oh, you, should, you shouldn't be drinking. But then like they, they haven't lived the life that you have. So yeah. you obviously have someone like Sonny Bill come yeah. in and go, oh, maybe just turn it down a little. You're like, oh, shit, he's, he's been in position 100%. like me. It makes sense, yeah. And even like the sort of media scrutiny, bro, like, it, there's a lot of people that hate him, you know what I mean? And then there's a lot of people who love him. Mm. And so that was a an angle for me when, when he spoke to me about stuff like that, is just being able to um, sort of not block it out, but like understand that you can't please everyone. But if you can be settled and content with yourself, then that's when you sort of find true happiness. And like after learning that sort of stuff and just speaking to him, whenever I'm around him, I start to, to see things a little bit clearer just because we have like really honest upfront conversations it's not like we just go there and just talk and beat around the bush yeah you know what I mean so and I think that I, I went and seen him in, in Tokyo after his last game and I thought he was going to be real upset and like sort of a few people had a go at him for being not being upset after they lost the game mm. and it was like he he said to me he's like bro it's not that I'm not upset but it's just that bro there's bigger problems than us losing the game of rugby mm. like of course I wanted to win that game and I went out there and did everything I could to to win that game but we can't change it now so I'm upset about it. Mm. Um, you know, I'm here with, with you, my brother, like um, my wife, my kids. Everyone's happy and healthy. I've got so much more to look forward to. Like the game, yeah, I'm upset. Mm. But um, there's more to me than just winning a rugby game. And bro, like that that sort of stuff's powerful, bro. When you when you have that control and that sort of um, understanding of things, bro, no one can really stop you. Yeah, because like obviously, like we talked about this yesterday, and um, like we've had a friendship that's developed over a long time. We don't talk as much as we need mm. to, but when we hang out, it feels like we're yeah. hanging out forever. But I probably could say this like probably weren't, like the most book smart dude at school. But when I listen to you speak now, you're so well rounded, you're so diverse, you got great perspective just through life. And you talked about you're a bit more street smart, but the way yeah. you talk, you sound like you're. Like just like you can tell you've been through a lot, but you tell you've sort of sat back and thought about it. And you speak really well on it now. So and, and the boys are sort of talking like, "Fuck, he's smart. He's smart." Yeah. And I was like, "He wasn't smart at school. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not smart at school." But the thing is, bro, is like once you live through those experiences, when you when you step back from them and and understand them, and I think that like we were speaking about this about um, the situation at the Reds when I went and played club footy. Like at the time, I sort of like really pissed off and a little bit lost when it first happened because I was thinking... Do you know why it happened? They're just trying to smoke you out? Yeah, I think I was just on too much money for, um, you know, Thorny just took over as a coach and he wanted the guys that he wanted. Mm. But you're not able to do that when he's paying me. Mm. You know what I mean? So I think the easiest way 
for them was to try and force me out. And, and well, like, did you have a meeting with him face to face? And yeah, bro, it was all weird, man. Because oh, he's a man, he's a man, eh? Like, obviously, like, watch. Oh, you probably have a different opinion of him now, but watching him play footy and go through all that stuff with the All Blacks and stuff. Yeah, bro, and that's like what he's achieved on the field and stuff like that. Like, he's achieved everything you can. Mm. But the thing that um, for me was like, excuse me, I got a message and it was like, um, like I just done three days of um, preseason training camp, bro, like getting flogged for three days. Mm. And I get a message on our day off at night. It was like 9.30 at night, 10 o'clock at night saying, oh, Quay, you don't have to, from our team manager, yeah. Quay, you don't have to do the promo tomorrow and you don't have to um, do the training in the morning. Just come in for the meeting in the afternoon. I thought, oh, fuck, it's a bit weird. Mm. Like, why don't I have to do that stuff? And like, it was kind of like I was thinking, oh, maybe they're just looking after me. I'm getting a bit old. Like, just done three tough days getting flogged. Maybe they're just giving me the sort of session off. Came in there and I had like just a weird feeling. Like, I run Coda and I said, bro, like, I just don't have a, a good feeling about this. Something's happened to one of the other boys two days ago. I said, maybe I'm on the, the same chopping block. And, off the back of that, he just said, bro, just go in there, hold your head high, whatever they say to you, just say sweet, thank them and walk out. I sat down and and um, the conversation, like it, it just started really weird, bro. It was just me, Thorny and um, the GM. Mm. But the way that they were speaking to me was like kind of really speaking down to me. Mm. And one well, of the, Like what's one of the things that it said? Oh, bro, like they said like, um, hey, oh, Quaid, mate, like so you're the – like fifth choice um, fly half. <laughs> I was like <laughs> fifth. Yeah, and I was sort of like I giggled because I was like, like, okay, now what you were saying like has no merit now because you're just taking the piss now. Mm. Like I understand if you said you would prefer this guy over me, mm. but saying like I'm the fifth that there's so you're saying that there was um, two guys at the Reds ahead of me, then two club football players that were ahead of me. Mm. I just said, no, nah, you're just insulting. You're trying to make me piss off and for me to do something stupid here. And I just said, oh, okay, mate. Like I said, that's – I can understand. Like that's that's your opinion. I appreciate it. Um, thanks, mate. And I just got up, shook their hands and left. Mm. And from then, bro, I just knew, like, if they had to kind of approach it different and said, look, we – this is what we um, see. Like it's not that we don't see a future for you, but like we want to get these guys through mm. and you're taking up a heap of our, our money – um, you know, then I would have probably gone, okay, like I'll look at a different option, you know, and try to work with them. But if I had still been able to come in, but they just told me, don't come into training anymore. You, you're not required. You don't have to do anything. Like, blah, blah. And I was like, just, yeah. But again, like I felt really like lost because I was like, fuck, what do I do now? Mm. Like, is this the end of my career? That's what we were speaking about yesterday. And until I sat back and I spoke to Coda, um, spoke to Sonny and that, and it was like, it's not actually a bad situation. Mm. You know what the situation that I'm in It's not actually a bad situation Let's strip it back and, and understand it Let's understand what I'm going through Instead of just um, letting your ego take over it You know what I mean And I think that that's um, where we're able to sort of Pick them up on Like they were hoping that my, my ego would take over And I'm like I'm too good for this I'm too good to be playing club football mm. um, You can't treat me like this And, and bit back and, you know, That's where you know, being able to sit back from the situation, understand the situation, understand what was going on. That's why I was sort of saying that um, um, one of the bros yesterday, that like bro, when you can take the ego out of it, um, because all of us as footballers, ego is a part of why you got to where you are. 100%. You know what I mean? But when you can, when, when you're making a decision, if you can take the ego out of it, then you're able to um, strip it back and just understand it for what it is. And then – you're able to attack it in a, with a better mindset, you know, and I think that that, that was what was for me what um, made me start to see it clear. So just with Coder and so just having those guys in your corner, because yeah, the easy thing would have been to do, so say if you go back just to your normal mates, well, fuck these blokes, like, that just makes you angry and angrier, doesn't it? Right, yeah. and that's that's what I sort of started going through because I was like, fuck, you know, fuck these guys. Yeah. Um, and I was doing that, you know, for like two, two, three days, I was like that, I was just fired up, mm. and Coder's like, bro, calm down. Like, this is the situation. Talk me through it. And I was like, nah, fuck that, you know. And then he kept talking to me about it, ring me every couple of hours, and I started to see it. Then I was like, no, oh, no, you're, you're right. You're on the right track here. I understand it now, mm. you know. And, like, without having those guys there, right, anything could happen, you know. Mm. So you go to club rugby. Um, yeah, obviously done a right in there. Like, <laughs> train hard, pretty hard. So talk us about that. Like, obviously, when you go from 
being like the guy and then going back to club rugby, it would take some adjustment. And we talked about ego there. But how do you, how do you adjust to all that? Well, like the thing was, it wasn't very hard to adjust to because um, what it was doing, bro, it was like it was actually more eyes on me because of what I was doing because mm. I was sort of making a stand. And I was saying to you that it had happened to two younger guys before me, but no one actually heard about that because those guys weren't really a name. Like they had no sort of name behind them, but um, when it happened to them, it sort of just happened. They left, um, and so they felt that they could do that to anyone, you know. And um, so for me, when I went back to club football, it was just like one of those moments where I was like, okay, if I go back to club football and I'm not the best on the field every game, then this backs up what what's just happened to me. Mm. So I've got to go there, and this is a challenge for me to be able to stay in good shape, um, be the best on the field, athletically, physically, um, you know, my rugby smart, things like that. And when we got down to the games, bro, it was just at local clubs, but we were packing it out. Mm. Like one of our games, like, so we would have had like sort of 7,000, 5, 7,000 people packed into this little ground mm. all there just to watch a, a club footy game. That's mad. And so it was a good feeling, you know, like it was like, oh, you're actually making a difference. Then you turn TV on and these blokes are playing at Suncorp with 5,000 people there. Yeah. You know what I mean? So we were just like, <laughs> okay, so – um, you're not missing out on anything. Mm. Like I'm, I'm having fun. I'm making a difference. I'm able to help my club, which my club was very poor. So I was actually able to help them out. Mm. And they started to make money by people coming there, buying alcohol, sausages, things like that. And so I was able to make a difference, but also give back to the club. You do, you know what, do you know what I loved about that little phase you went through? Um, you went, you went almost on the attack on social media, and no, not not like personally, like you fronted it, you accepted it for what it was, because yeah. a lot of people wouldn't be able to do that. And then you started implementing all your training and teaching people how you trained, and you got met a guy yeah. called Coach Sons. Obviously, I don't know him, but I know him by his Instagram name. <laughs> how did all that come about? Yeah, same sort of thing, bro. Because I was like, like the whole thing was was quite isolating, bro. You know, like so I didn't have any help from from trainers. I didn't have any help from like nutritionists, physios, things like that. So I kind of had to do all that stuff on my own. And when Sonny called me and I went over there, trained with him for like six weeks, we got a trainer, um, we got like a, a, a gymnast trainer to do core work and stuff like that. So when I went back to Brisbane, I just kept doing it. So I wake up in the morning, go to training, um, do my own training session. Coach Sons would text me, send me a program through. I'll go to the my boxing gym with um, Shannon King, my boxing trainer. Mm. And we just do the the workouts like every day, bro. And then like, I started just like documenting it, just sort of videoing it, posting it up, and people just loved it because they were like, "Oh, they're seeing what I was doing and going, okay, well, we can probably do this too." You know, you don't mm. need to be in a professional environment. And then, like I was saying to you, the thing that really helped me and changed my mindset around it was that I was so used to people since I was like sixteen, seventeen telling me um, what I had to do and what time I had to be there. So I actually had to go and do this myself. And it's almost, almost from a younger age. I've talked about this before. Like when you're from five, you're like, you go to school, you go to class. Like, do you know what yeah, I mean? Bro. Go to high school, you're at maths, you're at yeah. thing. And you roll straight into a professional system. You don't you don't really have time to think for yourself because like, you're always told where to be, exactly. what, what to wear, how to yeah. play. And so without without choice, you've got to be there. Mm. So even if you don't want to, like you wake up sick. So when you're playing um, for the Warriors and stuff, Say you woke up and you, you're sore, didn't feel well, you still got to go to training. Whereas this, like, I didn't have to go. Mm. I had nothing to do. I just had to be Tuesday, 6 to 7 p.m., Thursday, 6 to 7 p.m. That's all I had to do. So on a Monday morning when I woke up and I was like, I've got to go lift weights because I know I've got to lift weights to be a good footballer mm. or I've got to go run to be a good footballer. I've got to go do these things off my own bat. And so when I woke up and I was sore, tired, a little bit sick, I'd be like, I just got to go do it. And that's one of those competitive things that we spoke about yesterday. You sit at, if, if I didn't go do that, at night I'd lie in bed looking at the ceiling and, fuck, I know that I just let myself down, you know? Yeah. You that, can't sleep, eh? Yeah, you can't sleep. So that sort of was what, like, helped me and something that I kind of didn't really have to learn throughout my career. So, like, going through all of that and doing that, now when I go to training, so I'm giving my program at train now, even in Japan, giving my program, okay, now that's the bare minimum. Mm. So I do the session that our trainer has given us. But on our day off, we'll go do another session because I know it's going to help me. But I have that drive to be able to do that myself. Yeah, we don't really have that culture here in Australia, the sort of train every day. And it wasn't until like – it's like almost sunny border over here, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like because in America, like you, we watch all the boys over there, all the basketball players. They train every single day, don't they? 
And like, when we're over here, like, fuck, when's the day off? Yeah, so you're looking forward to it. Day yeah, off. looking. And then you get around all the older boys and like you're at training until two. Like, yeah. fuck, what are we still doing here? We should be home by now. <laughs> so there's sort of that. And I think there's slowly going to transition into that thing. So you're in that sort of phase now where you, you'll do something every day. Because you know that like, so if, if you want to be the best, bro, the only way you can do it is by using your program that you have as the bare minimum. Mm. You know what I mean? And like, so we used to think that like once you got through that day, fuck, finally, let's go, yeah. let's go, go home. for coffee. Yeah, let's yeah. go do this. Whereas like, I'm like, okay, hey, that's the bare minimum. That's what everyone's doing. Mm. So if I want to be the best of everyone, okay, so I've got to do more. So I've got to do extra stretching. I've got to do extra core. I've got to do extra fitness mm. and like work on my skills. So when I, when I get my program, I look at it and I think, okay, where can I fit in to do these little things? And so, like, is it a counterbalancing? So, if you've got a big running day, are you like, here's my bare minimum for training? Shit, I need to be stretching for an hour after that. Is it, or do you go, fuck, do I need to run more than these blokes? Yeah, well, so, like, I know that, like, say, in a session, like, if everyone's running, let's say everyone's running 6K, mm. I'll go in there after. Like, if, if I ran, say, 4K, but like, there's some days where I know that I've got to run less, mm. but I'll be like, okay, that's what everyone's running 4K. Where can I get in an extra bit? So, like, if I'm in one of the sessions, um, like I'll see a support line and I'll just go after it. And I know I'm not going to get the ball, mm. but I'll just go after it because I'm going to get some a little bit extra in that. And then so I can look at that on the GPS. But for me, it's more about when I start to, you know, when you go through injuries and you get a bit older, that's where it, it kind of comes in because you go, okay, now how can I look after my body a bit better? So every time before training, if we have training at 9 o'clock, I'll get in there at 8. Like I'm in there already by eight stretching. So I've got a stretch routine that I do every morning, every afternoon. It doesn't mm. matter if I'm training or not training. And like with that, bro, my body has just like been so much better. Mm. And just being able to have that discipline too, because we spoke about it around diets. Like a lot of people want to like say change to vegan after watching Game, Game Changers. Mm. So then, then they'll go, okay, now because I'm vegan, like my footy's better or because I'm vegan, like my, my body just feels so much better. And for me, I don't necessarily think it's just because you did that. I think it's because you brought the discipline in to do that. Mm. And so vegan's not an easy diet to follow. Like you got to be like very disciplined in getting your food, preparing organized, your food, yeah. organised. And I think that a lot of players... That's quite a carby fucking <laughs> diet, isn't it, if you're not prepared? Bro, and if, it's like anything if you're not prepared. Like, <laughs> bro, you could end up like, oh, man. Like, so I looked at some people who – some foods that are vegan, like I was saying, like Pringles, stuff like that. Like, mm. you're not organized. Like, you just be smacking Pringles every day. But so I think that the discipline side of it is is the thing that has sort of helped me. So for me, stretching is just added discipline. So you wake up every day and stretch first thing? Yeah, every day, bro. So like – How long do you stretch for? Oh, so it'll be my stretch routine will go for about 27 minutes. So mm. every stretch I'll hold for, for three minutes. And it's one of those things I just learned as well. So Sonny sent me this thing. Um, there's a guy on Instagram called Knees Over Toes. Yeah. And um, so obviously, like, I had a knee injury. Sonny had, he's got no meniscus in his knees. Oh, really? Yeah, bro. He hasn't had meniscus since he was, like, 24. Shit. So, like, so you can imagine his career, like, being able to get to where he was, people would have told him that he would have been finished by, like, 26, 27. Mm. Um but like, so I followed this program and once I started doing it, I'm not saying that, again, that just because I was doing that has made me feel better. It's just that because I added that in, that discipline to be able to do that every day when I'm feeling shit, when I don't want to stretch. Like at night, sometimes I would have screwed up my day and been late home and usually I want to stretch before bed and I'm mm. like, it's already late so I'm not going to get my eight hours sleep or whatever it is. I'll go, nah, I've still got to do it. Mm. So if I screwed up my day and I'm going to get less sleep, that's my own fault. I've got to be more organised throughout the day. You know what I mean? <laughs> See, a lot of people blame other people or scenarios for that, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like uh, people going to work and, fuck, I've got every red light. I fucking leave earlier. <laughs> yeah, Same sort of scenario, is it? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I remember reading I remember reading about Sonny Bull and he said uh, he, he missed a stretch night one night and ended up pulling his calf. Yeah. It was just small stuff like that. And I was like, does he stretch every night and every morning? Right. See, and that's the same thing. That's sort of what got me into it by – by hanging around with him, like I'd be lying on the bed in the hotel, bro. Yeah. And I'd be just sitting there on my phone. And he's on the ground stretching for like an hour. And then I look at him and I start feeling bad. I'm like, fuck. Like, I know I should be doing that. Yeah. But I wasn't. And it's just a difference, bro. You know, like um, a guy like him being able to just do that, it's just a routine for him now. But mm-hmm. so now since adding that in, and I've been doing it for like a year and a half now. So it's just easy for me now. Wake up. Start stretching. Because I hit 27 minutes. I'm like, fuck, that's a long time. Bro, it is, man. When you start doing it, at, at the start, like, you you want to cut it short. You're like, fuck, three minutes holding this. 
I hold, um, <laughs> kind of just want to cut it short. But then, like, I know, okay, if I'm going to do my stretch, I've got to, I've got to factor that time in. Mm. So if I, if I have to be at training at eight to start my stretches, okay, what time I've got to be up to have breakfast? Mm. Do you know what I mean? So you got to factor all that stuff in. But again, just back to the same thing: add discipline. Nutrition. What do you, what do you do during the day? Talk us through your day. Oh, bro, so every morning, so like in Japan, I have a few of the boys over. A um, couple of them were sort of struggling with their weight, things like that. But just also. For me, just to build that like um, friendship and brotherhood, all the boys stopping at my house, I'll cook them breakfast. Um, you know, we just sort of go through um, omelets, have like um, veggies, omelet, a little bit of rice if we've got a big day, um, you know, things like that. And so then, like, I eat a lot of fish, um, a lot of chicken. I, like, I love my meat. So I think that, that um, I don't think I'll be ever going vegan anytime soon, but I like adding in like vegan nights yeah. or um, vegetarian nights, you know what I mean? Just to, again, like go back to discipline. I just want to try s- different things and see how they make me feel and mm. and also just being able to organise that sort of stuff. But, yeah, I'm not, I'm not too hard on my diet. Like, and I think I went through a stage in my career where I was getting injured a lot and I was so focused on my diet. Smoking peanut butter and toast. <laughs> so that's, that's still my f- and I say it to everyone. If, I, if, if the world was um, to run out of food and they could only keep one food on the planet – It'd be peanut butter and toast for me. Yeah. I could eat that breakfast, lunch, dinner, and and be happy. Mm. Mm. Uh, but yeah, diet for me is it's never been something that like I've struggled with. It's trying to put weight on. You yeah, know? okay. Yeah, but um, when I went the other way, like I was I was hanging out with guys who were not really footy players, but they were like gym junkies, and I was sort of like, okay, if my body looked good then it must be strong, you know, mm-hmm. like so doing lots of body weight exercises, um, eating no carbs, things like that, and I was shredded. Mm. But you go into a game, have one collision, bang, so, shoulder gone, mm. you know what I mean? Like um, bang, rib cartilage gone, um, you know what I mean? So like for me, I started to just not care as much about my diet and I sort of have this thing that if 90% of the time you're eating well, the 10% of the time doesn't really affect you. Mm. And that has played a big part in like just also sanity, bro. Mm. <laughs> like – being able to go out with your mates and if they're going out to pizza, just go out and eat pizza and enjoy it. Um, not go out there and go, oh, sorry, I can't eat that. Mm. Or, you know what I mean? You're annoying them people oh, where they do right. that. Well, fucking stay home then, yeah. fuck yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> al- alcohol yeah. consumption, kid that started drinking pretty early and from Toke, we don't mind a beer in that. Or what's it like now for you? Oh, bro, I don't really drink anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, like, like any probably footballer, I was sort of introduced to it very young. Like we started drinking, like we we're saying, fourteen. Mm. Um, you know, doing stuff like Shit, that. Still drinking. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's it's something that like, I, like socially, I like I love it. Like what it used to you know, give me socially, but also there's there's so many different ways now to get that same stimulus. Similar, yeah. You know what I mean? So like you don't like. Like we went across to the um, pub yesterday and I just had sparkling water just having a yarn. Mm. And, like, we were still able to have a yarn, speak for a couple of hours and have a laugh. I didn't even have to have a beer. But, like, I'm definitely not against it. You mm. know what I mean? Like, I, you know, but for me, it's just not something that I need anymore. You know, I used to sort of rely on it. And it was like one of those things where you, it's like a mask. You have to have it to be able to – Socialise. Yeah, socialise. Chase or, girls or yeah, you know what I mean? that. Like, you know what let mean? your inhibitions down because – if you said something and you said something that was wrong or like you know someone didn't like it, you blame it on the alcohol. <laughs> I mean, like, blame it on the uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. All right, so obviously you're going through a lot of shit, come back and force your way back into Melbourne Rebels, and then ran into a guy called Michael Checker. Well, what's what's the what's the go there? Or do you want to touch on the Rebel stuff as well, or what? Sort of all, um, all wrapped in one. Yeah, okay. Because the whole excuse me, the whole check stuff was like, um, you know, when when I was going through the red stuff. Like, mate, that everyone thinks it was just like thorny, but like it's obviously come from the head. You can't go and do a move like that without having the someone at the top tick of approval from the governing body. You know what I mean? From from the head, and so Ch- checks obviously said like, no, nah, he's got no need for me. You know, mm. and so again, like I, I just played club footy and I was just determined to work my way back in. Um, you know, try and get back in, play football, enjoy football, um, earn my pay packet, and. Um, like so, once we got to talking about like a, a release, and this is where it sort of all uh, meshed in for me. It was like we were talking about a release with AAU, and they were like, "Yep, you know, we we want to give you a release and like a work on a payout." Um, I was like, "Yep, sweet, so I can look elsewhere." And when I was going through that, I, I sort of asked about a um, like my how it was going to work. 
and check with these clauses. Say, yeah, we'll, we'll give you a payout, but you can't play Super Rugby for in Australia. You can't play Super Rugby in New Zealand or South Africa. So you you basically he's trying to send me Sun Wolves or Argentina. Nah, I couldn't play Super Rugby. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. So like my my payout or my release was determined by I can't play for any of these teams. So I can only go and play in Europe. Mm. So you're trying to send me as far away. Like if I want to play Super Rugby still. Like, that's fine. Like it's up to those clubs who want to, if they want me to play for them. You know what I mean? But I think that, so it just it seems so fishy and weird that why can't I play for any of these teams? If you want to get rid of me, then get rid of me and let me go um, play football somewhere else, wherever I can get a get a gig. You know. Mm. And so that's where, like, for me, it just started. Like I was like, mate, this bloke's got it in for me. You know. Like, um, and do you know? Do you know what it's from, or is, is there anything that it stems from the original like? You know what I mean? Because you, you were playing good footy too and people thought you went to the Rebels, you guys started killing at the start of the year, people were saying that you should be in. Yeah, bro, like, I, I, to be honest, I don't really know, but like, I, I know for a fact that like, um, you know, I'll speak my mind. Mm. Um, and so He saw that as friction to what yeah, he was trying to do. Like, and, I, and I think that maybe for him, it's like, if I wasn't just saying yes and agreeing to what he was saying – then I was a bad team guy, you know, mm. like from his perspective. And because like, there was a lot of things going on again in, in that locker room and like um, that weren't running smoothly. And when we'd have a team meeting, that would say anyone like got a, a different point of view and I'd say, oh, well, yeah, like how about like I, don't, I see it this way. Yeah. And he'd get really offended by that, you know. And I think that that – He's um outside of football, he's quite a successful man, yeah, very, isn't he? Very, he's loaded, eh? Yeah, very. What, through clothing or his manufacturing or something? Because someone told me that the other way. They go, he's worth millions. He just coaches for like shits and giggles. So, yeah. like, obviously, if you've been a success outside of there, had a little bit of success with the Waratahs, he must think things need to run in a certain way. You know what I mean? And you'll come through and start saying stuff. Yeah, 100%, bro. Like, I, I don't know what his success is from, um, but he's definitely successful off it. And I think that, again, that's sort of why he wanted to do it a certain way. Mm. And not that that's right or wrong, but like, we just seen it as players. Like, and there's certain things that were happening and that we just couldn't put up with, you know what I mean? And like, so when someone would speak up about it, and I think for me it was we had a conversation on the phone about selection. And I just said to him, I said, mate, like the things that you're telling me to go work, I'm doing those things. Mm. So if you're just not going to pick me and you just don't like the way I play and stuff like that, that's fine. Like, just tell me that and be up front. Yeah. So then I actually know. So I'm not, you're not just making things up and go, oh, go work on your passing. Like, I know I'm the best passer in the team. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, go work on your kicking. Okay, I can go work on my kicking. Awesome. I'll go do that. You know what I mean? Like, but don't just feed me bullshit. Mm. And I sort of said that to him on the phone. And like, I remember him getting the shits with that. And like, we just had a bit of a big argument. I said, Mate, like, and the same thing then, Scott Higginbottom um, got off the phone with him, had the same conversation, rung me in, and we basically said, like, bro, we had the exact same conversation two guys never to play for them again, mm. you know, mm. um, just pushing back a bit. So it's not that we we're pushing back. It was just more so – You want a bit more transparency? Yeah, you know, and just honesty, bro. Mm. Like so when you get honesty from a coach and say you, you just know, okay, he prefers this guy. And that's what I said to him. I said, mate, you prefer him and like that's fine, but just tell me mm. because so then I'm not just going out there running into a brick wall every, every training session to try and get better when um, I know I'm not going to get picked. Mm. So if you're not going to pick me, that's fine. Like, I understand that. Go with your guy and like, I'll respect that. But I'm out here trying to bust my ass on the things that you're telling me to do and I'm getting nowhere. Mm. And like, which is, that was the sort of frustrating part. Mm. So when it's all said and done, as a footballer, how do you want to be remembered? Oh, bro, like I haven't even put too much thought into that because hopefully it's not all said and done anytime soon. But, you know, like for me, man, it's... Because you, you're, you're, obviously there was Carlos Spencer, he played that sort of style of football, mm. but in terms of our generation, in terms of the social media generation and highlights package generation, you're almost like the equivalent of Benji for us in mm. rugby league. You know, we looked up to yeah. Benji. Like, I've got mates that are the same age as us that look up to, like, they go, fuck Wade's cool. Or like, because the way you play the game, the way you carry yourself outside of football, you're into your fashion, you're into all this fucking cool shit, you travel. Like, I think you were the guy that sort of started that sort of phase. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and that's like, Again, bro, like I, like you said, we, we didn't really have anyone to look up to like that. Mm. And so like when, when I first started coming through and social media started to sort of come into play, it's just something that I enjoyed doing. And so 
being able to kind of like pave a way or set an example and you know, like we were speaking about yesterday is like some of the things that I've done, hopefully people can see and go, okay, we're not going to get pushed around by the organisation. Um, but also like I, I feel like I just have fun doing what I'm doing. Mm. So like enjoying it. Like So the life of being a footballer is such a, a fun life, bro. And like, I hope that um, you know some of the things I get to do, like travel, um, you know, fashion, things like that. I hope that a lot of the players start to enjoy those things as well, and just find something outside of rugby or whatever your sport is that you can enjoy as well. Mm. And I think I left that very late in my career to start doing, like you know, start being yourself. Yeah, you know, and I, mm. I was trying to be what the um, image for a rugby player should be. Mm. Like you know, when I was younger, I just tried to dress how all the other players in my team would dress. Because I was like, oh, okay, this is what a rugby player dresses like. This is how they act. This is how we speak in interviews. But then when I started just being myself, I just started feeling more comfortable. I started enjoying what I was doing so much more, you know. And I think mm. that that, for me, is something that um, you know, hopefully I can leave on, on the next generation. Mm. Oh, so your passion for fashion, where did that come from? Oh, bro, like... You kind of always been into it, even when we didn't have money and that. Yeah. You, you, you wanted the nice shit, didn't you? That's, bro, when I had no money, I always wanted the nice stuff, but I could never have it, mm. you know? So when, when I started being able to get money to, to buy things, it was like, just enjoy having that stuff. And fashion for me was just, a, again, like it was another way of being able to, like, kind of express yourself, but also it was a hobby that I could never do before, you know? So, like... When you could go out and just say, see t shirts that you like, or, or pants or shoes that you like, go buy them mm. and play around with them. Um, so beforehand, you'd see something you like, and it was just like, fuck, I wish I had that. Yeah. You know, so like fashion just started to become a way of, okay, if I'm going to spend money, I'm going to spend on something I like. Mm. Because a lot of the time, bro, you just waste money on things just because it's like, I went through a, a watch phase. Mm. I just loved watches, but it was a symbol of being successful. You know? This is a little cock measuring thing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, you know what I mean? But whereas like now, like I don't care about like what the brand of watch is. Like I think I went a, a Casio now, like a G Shock Casio. It's a fun watch and I, I love the watch. But it's not about like buying a um, expensive watch just to have on your wrist because it's an expensive watch so people know you you're a successful rugby player or something. Mm. You know what I mean? So fashion for me just started to become something of okay, like vintage tees. I, I like vintage tees, they're not expensive. You can go buy them from anywhere and if you find a good one it's like the adventure no, yeah. of finding it you know what I mean have you gone thrift shopping over in LA and that that's fun oh, man not in LA but yeah. like, I've done it in Osaka oh they got they got a big like, thing like, there it's crazy it's like it's a massive culture there's a, a, a place called American Village like, I think it's called American Muda mm. and uh, it's just literally this area where it's just like vintage or stuff like that and you can just find the biggest gems but you gotta go looking for it yeah that's the thing I love it and then yeah. you gotta find the right like you, f- you might find the right tea but then it doesn't fit, fit and then right. there's a stain on it or some yeah. shit like that so that I think that's the joy in it as well yeah. but I look at your fashion um, I can't really compare to anyone cause like your fashion's a little bit different cause you, uh, nothing really matches but then it all matches does, does that make yeah, sense yeah yeah, yeah. Is, is that strategy or do you just go fuck I'm just gonna wear this yeah sometimes I just pop it on and I'm like so I, like for me, and I was, I was speaking um, to one of the boys on Instagram the other day, is that like a thing that I like doing is just seeing colours and, and matching them. Mm-hmm. And like So things that don't match, um, like trying to match them in a certain way because there might be one piece that ties the whole thing together. Mm. Um, you know, and I just I started to like use it as a way of like, you know, when I, I always hear people talking about fashion of expressing themselves, but for me it's just more so expressing your personality. Mm. And so, so you think fashion is just an extension of your personality? Yeah, that's that's how I feel, you know. And like, and then if you're confident with it, so like, there was things that I never used to wear things because I was like, no, nah, I'm not confident. Like, I couldn't. Like, right, yesterday I think I was I was wearing an earring. Yeah. And um, Odell like. Yeah, but I just like I was just playing around with it. Yeah, and then, like, sick. And I just put it on. And I was like, oh, this is cool. And I was like, I'll just do you know what's it. funny about Corey trying to wear the same earring? But it actually suited him. But then he just like the same thing. He's like, oh fuck, I'm just gonna get paid out. So he took it See, off. But that's it, bro. And that's like. That's what everyone's so afraid of is getting paid out. Yeah. I think that's a culture that we have in, in Australia and New Zealand. Like, hey, don't get me started on this. Hey, Luke, you <laughs> fucking always talk about this. <laughs> and that, and that's, a, that's a big thing, bro, especially in Islanders as well. Yeah. Um, just paying each other out. Gee, um, stay humble, G. Yeah. Harder. <laughs> but that's, bro, for me, I'm like, man, like, I, I enjoy it. So, like, I'm going to try if I, if I like it, if I don't like it. You know what I mean? And, and a big thing was, like, hats, bro. I used to always wear hats, but, like, I'd only wear one type of hat because mm. if it fit, then I'd be like, okay, now that's it, the only one. The other hats don't look. Yeah. Don't look well. But then I just started like 
wearing hats now, I like them because of the colour. Mm. So like, like the hat I'm wearing now has got like a little bit of um, sort of like a baby blue green, and then like my um, shoes, shoes, are yeah, same sort of thing. Oh, okay, well, yeah, so it yeah. kind of ties in, but like it's mm. so far away from each other, it doesn't look like I'm just putting them to match. Yeah, um, and then like yeah, so. For me, fashion is just a little bit of an extension of your personality, like just being able to try things. One of the questions was, do you want to start a fashion label or clothing brand? I've always wanted to, but like it's pretty scary, bro. And like, and you'd be able to talk about this, but for me, it's like, like this sort of stuff is so foreign. Like mm. being able to go in and, you know, get online and start um, working out how do you start, where do you start, like where do you even, like, do you grab someone and say, bro, like, can you help me with this? Or, did you just go and buy a t-shirt and start printing on it? You mm. know what I mean? And it's like, it's such a daunting thing, bro, because like it's just the unknown mm. and all I've ever known and all I've ever put um, sort of time and effort is into being a good footballer. Mm. And so every bit of spare time I've had is working on passing, working on kicking, um, going to the gym, things like that. And then like when I think about business, I'm like, no, oh, that's not me. I need someone to help me with it. Yeah. And so it's just a little bit scary. I'd love to do it. And me and Sonny were having a, a conversation about it like about two weeks ago. Mm. Like, bro, we got to do it. And um, so who knows if that's, that's going to happen. But fucking let me know. I'll fucking help you. <laughs> Just give us a quick cut, eh? <laughs> Sonny, get me in. Fuck yeah. Um, so you're talking about working on passing and kicking. Um, where'd your kicking style come from? <laughs> uh, kicking style. So like when I was kicking goals, I've sort of gone away from it now. Um, I remember I had a big curve on my kicks like Thurston. Mm. So I used to a massive um, curl Swing on it, yeah. yeah. And I was comfortable with that because it was just easy to do. And it's not common in rugby, is it? Nah, not at all, bro. It's, it's seen as like um, like wrong. Oh, like a poor man's kick. Yeah. Like a rugby league kick, eh? A little bit blue collar. Yeah, blue collar uh, kicks. But um, Robbie Deans was like, came and grabbed me and I was, I was just lying to kick up and he just pulled my arm and said like, stay, keep your chest closed. So when I swing open with my chest make the ball do a, a massive curve. Mm. So he just held me and I went and kicked this kick and it just went dead straight. Mm. I was like, fuck. All right. <laughs> Jeez, we're on here. Yeah, we're on here. And then he, <laughs> he goes, so just pretend you're holding a rope. So I was like, just standing there, pretend I'm holding a rope and I went into kick and then I started practicing like that and then went into a game and I just went to kick it normal and I couldn't. Like when I put my arms down from this, it was like I lost my runner mm. and I was like, oh, shit. So then I just stayed like that and I kicked this goal. And from then on, I started kicking like that. And but lately, I've been kicking off the deck. So last year, I went through this phase where off the ground, yeah. So like using no tee. So I went through this phase last year where I just I literally couldn't get through the ball. Like I was hitting the ball, and I'd stop right there. Mm. And so you'd hit a few of them nicely, um, but when you hit a bad one, fuck, it'd be a bad kick. Mm. I was like, fuck, what's going on here? And then I remembered a few drills that I did with Johnny Wilkinson over in Toulon. And a few of these drills help you get through the ball. And so once I got through the ball, it just started smoking the kicks again. So I was using this technique, kicking it off off the ground, um, just in my warm-ups. And then once I got to my kicks, I put on the tee. Mm. But then I was hitting them so sweet off the ground, I just sort of thought, what am I doing? I just keep kicking off the ground. What do you do, whack your heel in the ground like old school? Yeah, old toe in the ground, old school, (laughs) sit the ball up and then go and kick it. And so I, I got off Amazon the other day, just one of those, you know, like an NFL yeah, kicking holder, so it's like a triangle thing with a a rod on it, and it just sits on top of the ball. Yeah. So when oh it, yeah, I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If if it got windy at train, I couldn't practice kicking. Yeah, that's true. The ball would be on the ground, and just fall over. Yeah. Because it had no tee to hold it up. So I bought this thing off Amazon, and I've just been kicking with that. So when it's windy, I can just still practice. Mm. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. They're mad, yeah, 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 but like, so like anyone, I always get questions on on my Instagram and stuff when they see me kicking like that. Like, what's this do? Like, what's this help? I just try and explain to people. It just literally was a, a a kicking technique, a drill that I used to get through the ball, get my momentum through the ball. Because you can't kick the ball off the ground without really aggressively getting through the ball. Mm. Otherwise, you're just going to sort of torpedo or just fly along the ground, smack the ground. Oh, yeah, and it gives yeah. you like it gives you accuracy in your strike because the ball is literally just sitting that high, like right on the ground. So mm. your your sweet spot's like that big. Mm. So if you miss hit it, so if you hit it too high, if you don't actually just nip the ground. You'll hit the middle of the ball and you're still a floater. Mm. So it just gets your, your strike so much better, like that strike zone. So I've been through that for the, probably the last six months and probably the best I've been kicking lately. I just every kick the same sort of strike. So it flies the same every time. Nice straight kick. And um, yeah, bro. You're missing in the right spot. Are you like that? You're right for today, yeah? Right, 
So if you miss, you should be missing just to the right of the post? Or? Just, yeah, just yeah. to the right, right of the post. See, like, people don't even understand small stuff like that, eh? They're like, oh, I miss, but like, there's different types of misses. There's a good miss and a bad miss. Yeah, if, so when we used to do our warm-ups, if you miss anything to the left, like that's like a, a bad kick. So we used to do this like a, a game. Mm. It would be like minus one point. If you oh, the Halligan left, game? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And if you miss to the left, like you minus one. Yeah, Halligan. Yeah. And um, bro, so like I still do that. I just still do that. Whenever I miss to the left, like I know exactly what I've done to mm. you. Know? So you just open up too quick. And um, but yeah, bro. So like came up with that style, but it's gonna be look a bit weird. Our our Japanese um, um, backs coach, he's saying he's got that kick that holder. And mm. he's like, so you want me to run this on to you? Because <laughs> you're kicking. And I was like, yeah, please, bro. Who be? Are you allowed to use it? Oh, I can't see why not. Yeah, because I thought you're only allowed certain tees and uh, rugby leagues like that. You're only allowed to use one or two oh, tees. Yeah? yeah, you can't can't make up your tee. Nah, can't cop a, like chop a cone in half and <laughs> roll it onto the field. I, I think you know, I, yeah, I actually have to look into that. But like otherwise, I just do the old toe on the ground. Yeah, smart. All right, so last couple of questions. Um, full back on rugby league. What's the closest you've ever come to coming to rugby league? Bro, like, oh, man, actually, I, question: Do you think you can kill it in rugby league? Oh, bro, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be that sort of. Disrespectful to the game and the people that are playing to say they'll come and kill it, mm. but I know they can play it. You know what I mean? Like, and what excites you about rugby league? Bro, the, the hardest thing about union is that you just don't know if you're going to get the ball back. Like mm. every single time someone goes into contact, gets tackled, you're trying to count the numbers of guys you've got left. How many guys went into the ruck? How many defenders went into that ruck? How many defenders up on the field? Where's the backfield? Things like this, because if the backfield's open, you got to take that space, even if it's out of your twenty-two. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas rugby league, you know you've got the ball basically for five five tackles. So you've got time to set up, start planning, plan ahead. Mm. So you can go, okay, we're going to hit up here. Let's try and attract these guys over here, run this set, bang, get at this guy. Um, but you can start planning it. Mm. Like, and so for me, it just seems easy. Yeah. Like in terms of the theory. Yeah, the theory and the, the st- strategic side of it. But I know that athletically, Fuck, it's a lot harder. Because mm. like, you look at a rugby league player, bro, every single player is basically the same size, like built. You, you spoke about this when Wallabies played, trained against the Roosters, yeah, eh? Bro. Yeah, So we, we trained against the Roosters and um, so bits of it were like rugby rules. Like when we were defending against them, we're defending at the ruck. Yep. And they sort of didn't know how to handle it because they used to be in space. Yeah, space. So like for us, that's like running off a line out. Yeah. When you run off a line out, you've got 10, like 20 metres in between each other. Mm. Like you just got so much time. Whereas every ruck that we play, the defence right on their va- advantage line. So for you to own the advantage line, like you've got to hit that flat as well. So mm. you're basically catching the ball right in front. So your decision making is right there. Whereas rugby league, you own the advantage line in attack because you're right there flat at the advantage line, the defence going back, coming forward, mm. back, coming forward. So I just – I look at the game and every time I watch it, I'm like, fuck, I'd love to play. Because um, I know that we played all through through kids, but testing yourself against the best at, at a professional level, um, that'll be a great challenge. And you know, I still want to play, um, but it's just a matter of if that would be possible, you know. Yeah. Um, would you look at somewhere like Toronto, obviously with Sonny in that there? Or would you want to come here and have and go uh, straight for it? Oh, bro, I wouldn't say no to anything. Like, I wouldn't rule anything out. Like, I, me and Sonny, like, I want to play a Sonny before. It's all said and done. Yeah, before I retire, before he retires. But I also wouldn't mind playing NRL, like, even if it was just for one season. Mm. Come for, um, just for, for the season or something like that. Like, even if it was like a injury reserve, I've always wanted to even just come and do some training with the lads and just mm. see what it was like. So, say I spent. Um, three, four weeks training with them just to see if I could even cut it at it. Mm. Um, but yeah, bro, it's just one of those things that always you know, draws me near. And like, you know, when we're speaking about signing a contract, you know, years ago when I basically signed with Parramatta and then I like, dropped my nuts and pulled out, yeah, I was like, I was so scared and like, I really wanted to do it, but I was like, feared that like I'd miss out on. Um, achieving what I wanted to achieve in rugby, you mm. know what I mean? And like, I didn't want to just be a guy that just floated in between and did nothing. And then, so I'm sort of glad that I didn't go to Para because we won the comp a year later with the Reds. Mm. Um, and Para didn't too, do too well after that. <laughs> he but, supports Para, so <laughs> yeah. But I mean, like, yeah, so I, I still want to play, bro. Like, mm. and it's, but if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. You know? I'm, I'm not hanging. You're not going to beat yourself up. Over yeah, it. yeah, yeah. 
Because, like, again, like, I'm happy with what I've been able to achieve and what I've done throughout my career, but it's one of those things that you go, okay, if, if the opportunity arose and, and it was able to happen, I'd love to do it. Sick. Hope you do it. Yeah, I have to. All right, bro, I just want to thank you for jumping on. It's been great to hanging out again. Obviously, probably hanging about five times in our 20s, so um, we've got a bit more free time now, so let's, let's hang out a bit more. Yeah, bro, 100%. Uh, obviously, people know where you are, so if I can, you know where to find them. Um, hit you up over the Instagram, wherever. Yep, yeah, look sure. look forward to hanging out. Might come to Japan and do a vlog or something, I have eh? to, bro. Please, uh, be mad. Please. Yeah, all right, bro. Later. Okay.